Turn with me to Psalms chapter 1. Begin a new study in the book of Psalm today. It is always a great day for me personally when we get to launch into a new study. It is always exciting, anticipating exactly what the Lord is going to show us in the study. And I can tell you, I've read through the Psalms. I, well, I've lost track of how many times I've read through the Psalms. And it is new and fresh every time I read through the book. Every time the Lord speaks and ministers and He is glorified times and I find myself just pausing wherever I'm at in the reading and just worshiping. It's an amazing book. Let me get the particulars out of the way right off the bat, shall we? So, Psalms. The songbook of Israel. Now, let me give you an example of uh, this point. Look at Psalm 4, if you will. And notice the heading, the introduction, if you will, to the psalm. Psalm 4. My Bible says, For the choir director on stringed instruments. A song of David. Now, any place in the Psalms where you see that designation for the choir director, this psalm was specifically written to be a public worship song. In other words, it was to be used in temple worship for the choir director. Now, all of them, for the most part, were used in worship in the Jewish worship uh, ceremonies, whether it was in the temple, whether it was later in the synagogue, they were used for worship. But those with the designation for the choir director specifically were used in that sense. There you see the Hebrew word for it, tehillim, for the Psalms, which means praise songs. The Greek word is, from, is where we get our word, the psalmoi means a collection of poems sung to musical accomplishment. Let me step down here so I can see. Psalm 40 is a good example of those definitions. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see and hear and put their trust in God. Many of the psalms were songs of public worship, as I've men, uh, mentioned. They were sung in the temple during corporate worship, but they were also the substance of personal devotion time. And that's how I like to use them. Many scholars classify the psalms as poems due to their structure. This, if you have a study Bible, this information is readily available. You don't have to do a deep dive into any kind of resources. Um, I've got a Ryrie study Bible, has that information that I'm about to share with you in the introduction to Psalms. Jewish poetry, especially the Psalms, evidences what is called parallelism. And that has to do with the relationship of one line to another. And you're going to see this as we work our way through the Psalms. In synonymous parallelism, the second line repeats the first. So there's an example, Psalm 15.1. Lord, who may dwell in your sanctuary? Who may live on your holy hill? Okay? Synonymous parallelism. In antithetical parallelism, it's just the opposite. The second line contrasts the first. There's an example, Psalm 37.9. For evil men will be cut off but those who hope in the Lord will inherit the land. Now, you know because you've been around here long enough that when you see but in the scriptures, that is an indication or an alert that there's a contrast coming. In synthetic parallelism, each successive line expands on the meaning. Psalm 19.1, which talks about God's revelation through his words, his statute, and his precepts. There's an example. The Psalms were written by people like David. Seventy-three Psalms for sure are attributed uh, to David's authorship. Now, some scholars believe that up to 75 of the Psalms were, were written by David. Uh, 
you could make that argument. I don't think it's, it's uh, something that we need to divide over. Uh, Asaph wrote 12 of them. The Korahites, or it'll be designated as a psalm for the sons of Korah, 12 of those. Solomon wrote a couple. Moses wrote a couple. That's something that some people don't even know. Moses wrote, uh, and, a, and a man by the name of Ethan wrote at least one of them. Heman is, is listed there uh, as well. So, the Psalms evidence a wide range of subject matter. All of those, praise, worship, thanksgiving, supplication, intercession. They also talk about fear, sin, betrayal, frustration, anger, depression, so on and so forth. There are several types of Psalms. There are lament Psalms. Psalms that are a cry out to God. We sang that song this morning, I Cry Out. That would be a good example of a lament psalm. Testimonial psalms that really uh, are, are telling other people about God's goodness and what he's done. There are penitential psalms, psalms that are sorrowful over sin, uh, imprecatory psalms. And those are some of the most difficult psalms because they are the psalmist calling judgment down from God upon the wicked. Now, a lot of people, they kind of recoil at that notion that we should be calling God's judgment down upon people. There are wisdom psalms, but most importantly, there are messianic psalms. Those psalms, of course, testify about Jesus, and we're going to see those maybe even as early as next week, depending on whether we get through Psalm 1 or not. And I think we will. It's only six. I shouldn't, I shouldn't boast like that. We... we uh, the plan is to be in Psalm 2 next week, <laughs> and, and then we're going to see it's talking about Jesus Christ. But you can look that scripture up yourself, Luke 24, uh, 44. But the Messianic Psalms, there are some of the things that it says about Messiah. He's the suffering servant, the good shepherd in Psalm 22. He's the living savior, the great shepherd in Psalm 23. He is the exalted king and the chief shepherd in Psalm 24. He's the high priest in Psalm 110. The stone that the builders rejected in Psalm 118. He is the coming king in Psalm 2. So if you read ahead for next week, try to figure out where that's at in there. It's pretty obvious, actually. So that gets us to today, Psalm 1. How many of you have traveled recently? Been to the airport, okay? went through the check-in process, because it is a process now, isn't it? I'm old enough, I remember back in the day when you just walked up to the ticket counter and said, I'm going to such and such a place, and, and even if you didn't have a ticket, you could buy it on the spot. No security checks, none of that stuff. You just got your ticket and walked right through the, the airport and went to your gate. Well, now there's all kinds of checkpoints, right? Security, every place. And you can't get but to a certain point in the airport before you're stopped and said, you have to have a ticket to get past this point, right? And I think about the Dayton airport. You're allowed to stand right there looking down that long hallway to see folks arriving, but you can't go any further. That's a checkpoint. Well... I was thinking about that in relation to Psalm 1. Psalm 1, if you will, serves as a checkpoint of sorts. Now, how so? Well, obviously by its position. It's the first psalm, right? But as we go through this psalm, what you're going to see is that Psalm 1 is, is a gateway in that the message that we see very clearly here is that you cannot understand, grasp, appreciate, apply, sing the psalms for yourself unless, unless you belong to the congregation of the righteous. Now, that's just a fancy way of saying unless you are a born-again believing Christian. How do I know that? Well, I'll give you two verses. And then we'll do a deep dive into this. But notice in verse 1 it says, How blessed is the man 
How blessed is the man. And then notice over at verse 6. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous. Those two thoughts, brothers and sisters, we're going to couple those this morning. How blessed is the man, and the Lord knows the way of the righteous. In order to be blessed and to be known of the Lord as righteous, something fundamental has to happen with you spiritually. In our culture... As Americans, we've been programmed, and I see it in our children, but I see it in adults as well, older people that should know better. But we've been programmed to believe that hard work always pays off, always pays off. Now, how many of you know that's not true? <laughs> hard work, brothers and sisters can become, at least metaphorically, a very, very heavy ball and chain. Hard work can actually enslave you. Hard work can rob you of the joys of life. It can rob you of contentment. Now, I spoke about this yesterday briefly, just as a little teaser on Facebook. I just put it out there to get some of your rational juices flowing. <laughs> if we just work harder, the saying goes, anything can be ours. The sky's the limit, right? Some people have made the same argument in America, and I just shake my head every time I hear it. But they've made the same argument within the context of education. Education is the key to the future. I wish I didn't, but I wished I would have prepared some examples for you this morning of people who are wealthy and never graduated from high school. Because the examples are enormous. Or people that are running corporations today and they've got a bachelor's degree, maybe. Maybe. How many people have started up companies in their garages and sold them for billions of dollars? So this notion that, well, all you need is an education and then you'll be successful, that's nonsense. That's nonsense. Now, when it comes to the Christian life, our blessedness, and I'm thankful for this, our blessedness has nothing whatsoever to do with how hard we work for it. <laughs> and you should be glad about that, too. If we had to work to earn, where would we ever know where the line's at where we've done enough? Well, we wouldn't, right? Right? If we were working to earn, we would never know, have I done enough? Well, for the believer, we look to the one who has already done it and done it all and done it perfectly, the Lord Jesus Christ. So our blessing, here's my point, our blessing, how blessed is the man, has nothing whatsoever to do with our own efforts Positionally speaking, now I make that distinction because righteousness in six does play into our efforts. Or are you backtracking, Mike? No, I'm delineating. I'm clarifying. We are saved by the finished work of Jesus Christ, and therefore we are blessed. Now we are righteous because of Christ's work on our behalf, but we are sanctified. That's a whole other term, isn't it? We are sanctified, positionally speaking, by Jesus. But we are also called in the scriptures to work out our salvation. Now, what does that mean, Mike? It means that we are saved positionally. We can't get any more saved. It's not like there are degrees of being saved. If you're saved, you're saved. And when you're saved, 
The Bible says that you are adopted as children, sons and daughters of God. We are joint heirs with Jesus. We have the uh, eternal inheritance as sons and daughters. That doesn't change. You don't become more of a son or more of a daughter. What does change, though, is when God sets us apart positionally. That's called sanctification. There is a context or an aspect where we must work out our salvation. In other words, we must experience sanctification. Now, what is that about? Well, that's where good works come in, right? Not works for salvation, but works because of salvation. See, you can't do good works to gain God's favor, but once we have received God's favor, we're expected to do good works. Somebody give me a scripture on that. How about Ephesians 2.10? For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, or we are his work, workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for what? Good works that we should walk in them. So after salvation, we're expected to do things. We're expected to honor and serve the Lord. So this idea of blessedness here, brothers and sisters, this is a gate, if you will, that alerts us to the fact that something is expected of us. I mean, we can't talk about God as our great shepherd in Psalm 23 unless we know him as the shepherd, right? We can't talk about God's forgiveness like David does in Psalm 51 unless we've experienced his forgiveness. We can't talk about worshiping God or his mercy as in Psalm 100 or 103 unless we've experienced that. So as we work our way through this psalm this morning, I want to point out some things to you. There are essentially three questions Three questions that are implied in this text. There are eight things that I want you to know and then four characteristics. All of that in six verses, my, yeah, all of that in six verses. Here are the three questions. I'm going to give you these up front. Three questions that demand an answer. They're at least asked in this. First question, what does it look like to belong to God? The psalm is asking the question, what does it look like to belong to God? Second question, what are the results of belonging to God? What are the results of belonging to God? And then the third question, what is the final destination of those who belong to God? And you'll get that answer, I'll show you, by contrast, by contrast. So what does it mean? What does it look like to belong to God? What are the results of belonging to God? What's the final destiny of those who belong to God? Now, those are three questions that you should be very interested in the answers to because they have application for all of us. So let's dive in. How blessed is the man, let's read it together. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither, and in whatever he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but they are like chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. The way of the wicked will perish. How blessed is the man. Blessing comes from God, brothers and sisters. And this is almost to me, as I look at verse 1, verse 1 reminds me of an Old Testament, Romans 12, 2. What, what's Romans 12, 2? Be not conformed 
to the image of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is the good and perfect will of the Father. So be transformed. So notice, this is exactly the point that the psalmist is making. The blessed man, the man who receives blessing, who receives God's favor, does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. So immediately you see that he's defining what it means to be blessed by a contrast. By a contrast. Doesn't walk in the counsel of the wicked, does not stand in the path of the sinners, and does not sit in the seat of the scoffers. Do you see the progression here? The man is blessed who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. What is that telling us? It says blessing comes from refusing to listen to the advice of the world. How many of you know that the advice, the counsel of the ungodly is not something that you want to take to heart and practice? Because the ungodly... Well, they'll tell us stuff like this. Well, listen, if you're tired of the one you're with, dump them and get somebody else. There's a lot of selection out there today. Oh, you're pregnant? Well, you don't need to be troubled by that. There's places that can take care of that problem. Oh, well, just do this or just do this. I was so blessed this morning to hear someone was relating a story about someone who's going through a difficult time right now. Sad, they're, uh, they're about to lose a loved one, and they know that. This loved one is, is not long for this earth. But they're going to be joining the Lord very soon. And this person said, and I came into the room where they were at, and they were sitting at the kitchen table, and they had the scripture open and they were just reading and meditating upon the word of God see that's the place we go for comfort it isn't to the editorial pages or what, what do they call those pages now where the and I'm probably dating myself does dear Abby even have a column anymore or is it somebody else it's her daughter okay well I don't even I don't even go there on those pages. Some people go to their horoscope. Can you believe that? In fact, I read a statistic that said 36% of Christians read their horoscope daily. Now, shockingly, that's the same percentage of people in the general population that read their horoscope. I was shocked by that. I determined a long time ago, of course, I don't... I don't not tempted by it anymore. That was many years ago. But when I would read the paper back in the day, I would deliberately skip past. I wouldn't read anything on the horoscope page. <laughs> you know why? It's not that I was superstitious. I didn't want my eyes to inadvertently fall on my horoscope and read something there and then something even loosely that could be construed as fulfilling that. Oh, gosh. <sighs> Now, I, you know, that, that was back when I was a very young Christian. And you have to set up those fences, those parameters, don't you, to help yourself. Now, I know what it is. It's, it's Satanism, paganism, basically. Uh, Satan worship, the, the constellations. But anyway, that's, that's for another day. So we don't, the blessed man... The one who is blessed by God does not listen to the world, doesn't walk in the council. So not just listening, but it also doesn't apply. Doesn't apply. Now I know that's a big part of the world's system of advice. When we go to them and we share our problems, and they say, well, well the problem is that you just need to do this, or you just need to do that. For the believer, one of the first things they should ask when somebody tells you that, well, what you need to do is you just need to do that, then the very first thing that should come out of your mouth is this. Can you show me where that's at in the Scripture? Because, brothers and sisters, if the counsel of the Lord is not that, 
how much of a benefit do you really think it's going to be to you? So the blessed man does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, that doesn't listen to the world. Notice the second thing, nor stand in the path of sinners. So this is taking it up a notch, brothers and sisters. Nor stand in the path of sinners. That means that believers do not go where the world goes. So first of all, we don't listen to what the world says. But secondly, we don't go where the world goes. We don't stand in the path of sinners. How many of you understand that when Christ delivers you, when he saves you, that all of that junk and stuff that was part of your pre-Christ life, he's asking you to leave that behind. It's a problem, especially for young believers, believers that are, that are very new in their faith. They have a tendency to have straying eyes. They, as life is changing and they're finding out and figuring out who they are in Christ, they have a tendency to look back at their pre-Christ days and not look back and go, oh, I can't believe. No, but kind of look back longingly. Kind of looking back and thinking, ah, oh, you know, it, it wasn't all that bad. Brothers and sisters, Christ died to slay that life, to put that life to death so that you could have new life. It may mean that you're going to have a whole new set of friends. I know that's the way it happened with me, and I've told my story before. Kathy and I were barflies. Weekends only, though, so technically that was okay, right? I mean, we didn't go Monday through Friday. It was just Saturday through Sunday. And all of our friends were there those whom we thought were friends. Man, they left us faster than rats off a sinking ship when they found out we got saved. <laughs> All of a sudden, you'd think that I grew two additional heads by the way that they looked at me when I shared with them what had happened. Let me tell you about Jesus. Jesus. What? Last weekend, we knew what you thought about Jesus, and his name was usually attached to some other adjective. And now, I've told this story before. My youngest sister locked herself in the bathroom and wouldn't come out till I left. And I said, I'm not coming out until you're saved. Or I'm not leaving till you're saved. She stayed in the bathroom. I started witnessing to her and she said, I, I don't want to hear this. And she went and locked herself in the bathroom. And I said, well, I'm not leaving. Well, I'm not coming out. I said, well, then I guess it's a standoff. <laughs> You'll get a whole new set of friends. God will replace all of that stuff. But here's what I discovered over time and then we'll move on. God also changes your want to, doesn't he? People say, well, what, what kind of fun is that? And, and I remember, Kathy, we had this conversation. When we first got saved and before we really got ingrained into a fellowship, and that's why community is so important, the body of Christ and getting plugged in, especially for new believers. I remember us looking at each other the first couple of months after we were saved where we really got involved thinking, what are we going to do this weekend? Looking around, oh, I guess I could fix this or work on that, or we would find things to try and do, but it wasn't very long before all of a sudden we were saying, I don't think we have time to do this. We don't do this. we got this to do. We're doing this. Getting ingrained into the body, having a new set of friends, and, and how amazing these friends became. They're lifelong friends. I can't remember 75% of the people's names that I thought were my buds then. But I can remember everybody's name that helped me along the way when I first got saved. 
I remember exactly what they did for me. So notice the progression. The blessed man, his life looks like this, or her life looks like this. They don't listen to the counsel of the world. They don't walk in the counsel of the wicked. They don't go where the world goes. They don't try to straddle the fence. They don't stand in the path of sinners. And then notice, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. So the blessed man, the one who receives God's favor, doesn't listen to the world, doesn't go with the world, and they do not do what the world does, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. And notice this progression. First, you start off just listening. Then, all of a sudden, you find yourself on the same path of those you're listening to. And then the next thing you know, you're sitting down and you've become skeptical of the Lord. You're actually frequenting the same places, you're getting your old friends back, and now you're starting to cast that doubtful eye upon God. The blessed man doesn't do that, avoids that whole situation. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers, but, but signifies what? Contrast, contrast. The blessed man, notice, his delight is not in the advice of the world. It's not in the activities of the world. It's not participating with the world. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law, he meditates day and night. Now think about that word there, brothers and sisters. The blessed man delights delights in the law of the Lord. That means in God's word. Are you at a place, and I've asked you this question before, are you at a place concerning the word that you look forward with eager anticipation to sitting down in your quiet place, wherever that's at? It's like, uh, excuse me, Mike, I have small children. Quiet place doesn't exist in my house quiet time, put them to whenever. Do you look forward to sitting down and getting into the Word? Here's what I know to be true. Well, that's not true for me. Don't try that. Here's what I know to be true. God calls all His people to spend time with Him. God calls all His people to spend time with Him. If you're not hearing his voice calling you to spend time in his word and in prayer, it's because you've muffled his voice. God doesn't call some of us and not others. He calls all of his children to spend time with him. A couple of years ago, I committed myself to be more obedient to God's spontaneous callings. Now, I think we should all have dedicated time. Whatever works for you. I'm an early morning person. I am up out of bed and within five minutes, I'm ready to go. I'm wide awake. I'm at my best. I'm sharp. I'm thinking. I spend time with the Lord right off the bat. My quiet time is in the morning before I go to work. Because at the end of the day, I'm pretty much fried. Nine or ten o'clock at night trying to do Bible study or whatever, that doesn't work too well. But whatever time works for you, spend a dedicated time with the Lord. Reading His Word and praying. But there are other times. See, you can't put God in a box. How many of you understand that? You can't put Him in a box. And if you try to do that, He's going to bust out of the box. So when He calls to you spontaneously, how many of you know what I'm talking about? You'll be sitting, you've just done something, you cleaned up this or did that or put a load of wash in and you've got this on your mind and you're going to do this and all of a sudden God says, why don't you come sit down and open my word and let's have fellowship. Anybody ever had that experience? You sit down, you grab the remote, guys, and you're ready to click that button for Sports Center and the Lord says... We haven't spent time together today yet. 
do you click the button and continue on your way or do you say, you're right, Lord, and set that down and get up out of your chair and go to your quiet place? God calls to all of us. Are you listening? Because here's the secret. If you're not listening and you continue to put him off, you're going to muffle his voice and you will never, ever get to the place where your testimony is that you delight in his word. And that is tragic for the Christian. Our testimony before God and before man should be that we love the word of the Lord and we love to spend time with it. But you'll never get there if you're not going to listen. God isn't going to forcefully drag you there. But he will continue to call and call and call. So we don't listen to the world we don't go where the world goes. We don't do what the world does. The flip side is that but we do delight. We look forward to spending time in God's Word. And in fact, beyond spending time, and how many of you, this is your experience, you can have your quiet time and then throughout the day at different periods of time, the Lord will remind you of Himself and His presence with you. And it reminds you of a point maybe even that you read that day. Out of your devotional or out of the word. Or he'll just speak to you just in a moment. Just a fleeting real quick moment. And you find yourself then throughout the day thinking about the Lord. He is never, I've got to tell you, and this isn't a boast. It just is what it is. He is never far from my mind. Never far. There's not a lot of time that goes by and my thoughts don't turn to him. So the blessed man delights, looks forward to spending time in the Word, meditates in the Word, day and night. You know, it's next to impossible to do the will of God if you don't know what the will of God is. And sometimes it takes chewing on God's Word to clearly understand what He's trying to communicate to you. Or is it just me that doesn't get it right off the bat? <laughs> Sometimes I have to really chew and think on something and say, Lord, what is it that you're trying to say? What is the application here for me? So he meditates on it day and night. Notice the result, though. When you get to that place, when you've set aside time, you've dedicated yourself to the discipline of the word and of prayer and of meditation, look at the result in verse 3. He will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither and in whatever he does, he prospers. Do you see what the picture is? The picture is the believer as a tree. I think of an oak because oak is a solid hardwood. The believer who will dedicate themselves to the Lord and to his word and to prayer, and to listening and obeying his ever still quiet voice when he calls to you. If you'll dedicate yourself to that, the result is going to be that you, and what is this a picture of? It's a picture of stability, strength, and vitality. Get those pictures, this tree, this oak tree. Notice where it's planted. It's planted by the streams of water. Now, what's important to remember, brothers and sisters, is that the context of this being written, this was written in an area that was very arid, desert, if you will. Remember Israel? Trees didn't grow anywhere. They only grew at certain places. And so in this kind of an environment, the psalmist had this idea in mind. Those who will plant themselves beside the source and draw from the source that will sustain them will be vital and will gain their strength. That sounds like another prophet, doesn't it? Isaiah. So stability, strength, and then vitality. Its leaf does not wither. And whatever he does... He prospers. 
So are you planting yourself in the Word of God? Is that the source for your strength? Is that the source of your vitality? Streams of water. Jesus talked about that, didn't he? Everyone who will place their trust in me, they will have streams of living water. And I think about that a lot. When Jesus said that, the context obviously was being born again. But I think it was much more than that. I think it also had to do with discipleship. I think it also had to do with evangelism. How many of you understand that the stream of living water that is Jesus, that is to come out of us, that we are to share with other people, has to be streams of grace, it has to be a stream of mercy, it has to be a stream of forgiveness? How many of you understand that when you offer that to the lost, when you help them to understand that they're separated from God by their sin, but that God is offering them mercy and grace, that they'll respond to that much quicker than they would judgment. Streams of mercy, grace, forgiveness, communion with Christ. And whatever he does, verse 3, it says he prospers. Now, some have taken that to mean something uh, completely different than what it does. In this context, it means that whatever he does in the name of the Lord or for the Lord will prosper. The wicked, verse 4, are not so, but they are like chaff which the wind drives away. You get the picture. It's a threshing time. It's a picture of judgment, and that's how... They did it in those days. They would crush the kernels of grain and it would remove the outer shells and then they would pitch it in the air and the wind would take the chaff away. It would blow it away. And the picture is that the wicked are not able to stand. They are not able to be stable. They are not able to be prosperous or as the picture we had in verse 3. The wicked are not so. They are like chaff which the wind drives away. I'm reminded of the parable Jesus taught about the foolish and the wise builders. The wise man builds his house upon the rock. The foolish man builds his house upon the sand. Yeah. Therefore, verse 5, the wicked will not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. Now, couple of things and you can dig this out and flesh it out yourself but here's what I see because we're talking about this has been framed by verse 1 and verse 6 the blessed man in the way of righteousness so blessing and righteousness it's talking about the saved man the saved woman the child of God but verse 5 still talking about the wicked when it says the wicked will not stand in judgment that stand there is a way of looking at or seeing justification. The theological term of justification. See, we have, believers, have standing in Christ. We will stand for the judgment because we're not standing in this judgment. But because the believer does not have or is not justified, they will not stand nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. That's communion with the saints. That's a picture of sanctification. The sinner, the wicked, does not have that. For the Lord, verse 6, knows the way of the righteous. It means the Lord watches over the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous. But the wicked, but the way of the wicked will perish. I'll give you a, a scripture reference. Read Psalm 37 on your own and on your own time. And this will really explain it and explode it out for you. Now, let me give you some characteristics. I have went through it quickly, but here's what I want you to see. Four characteristics of the blessed son or daughter. Four characteristics. Number one, the child of God, according to this psalm, first characteristic, the child of God, verse one, has a crowd-resistant mentality. 
crowd-resistant mentality. They don't listen to the world. They don't go where the world goes. They don't do what the world does. The believer has a crowd-resistant mentality. I remember reading about a 106-year-old woman who was being interviewed by a paper, newspaper, and the reporter said, So, what's the best thing about being 106? And, and she said, I'll give her credit for being sharp, because, man, she rattled it right off. She said, no peer pressure. <laughs> like, wow. Uh, I hope when I get older, I'm that sharp. Brothers and sisters, we need to understand God expects us to look different than the lost. God expects us, and I, I'm, I'm going to try and be delicate as I say this. <laughs> when we come together for corporate worship and teaching and fellowship, We shouldn't try to design our time together to attract the lost. Now, some of that may puzzle some of you, but here's what I mean by that. The assembly of the righteous looks like something particular and specific. We are here to worship the Lord, to hear, thus saith the Lord, and to hear through the indwelling Holy Spirit our marching orders. We are not here to make a lost person feel comfortable in our midst. We are not here to cater to the lost, trying to win their favor. And of all things, we are not here trying to get the lost to like us. Jesus said that the gospel will cause many to stumble. Jesus said that he is a rock of offense. We do the lost no favor if we do not get them to understand that in their present state, spiritual state, they are separated from God. That's not love. In, in my opinion, we've left the tracks if we make that our mission. Now, should we love the lost? Absolutely. We should. We should bring them in and welcome them. But we should not make any apologies for what the Word of God has to say. Remember, Paul said, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. It is the very power of God. If we soften this or change the message, how are we being obedient to the Lord? Well, we're not. So believers, keep this in mind. We don't want to look like the world. We want to be, as the scripture calls us, a peculiar people. <laughs> and such we are. We are a peculiar people. We should not think the way the world thinks. We should not look at things the way that the world... We should not use the same rational faculties that the world... Your mind has been redeemed. It's been transformed. Think like Christ. That's how we should look. So the blessed person, according to this psalm, has a crowd-resistant mentality. That's verse 1. The second characteristic of the believer, the true believer, because there are a lot of people that say, oh, yeah, I know Jesus. Wouldn't know it from your life. Oh, that's judgmental, Mike. Well, we're supposed to judge. Jesus himself was a fruit inspector, right? Aren't we supposed to be? I'm not talking about being rude or obnoxious. I'm just talking about being honest and truthful. 
You claim the name of Jesus, but you live like a lost person? There's a disconnect. You can still love them and tell them the truth. Come on. But the second characteristic of the true believer, the blessed person according to the psalm, verse 2, has a one-track mind. Has a one-track mind. Winston Churchill, <laughs> he said, a fanatic is someone who can't change his mind and won't change the subject. <laughs> That's how we should be with Jesus. I'm not, I don't care how many of these pseudo-scholars come out with a new work that calls into question the Scriptures. Well, I don't know if we can believe that or I don't know about that. Listen, I know. I know. The Scripture says, this is written so that you may know you have eternal life. Not so that you can, well, is it true? Maybe, I don't know. It could be the scholars. Who cares? What does the Holy Spirit say to you about the Word of God? Stop listening to all those egg heads with PhDs. You know what a PhD means? It just me it you know what you learn when you get a PhD? I can tell you this from experience. It shows you how much you don't know. And I'm being perfectly blunt. It 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 will show you how stupid you are. So all these folks with all these degrees after their name thinking that they're some kind of expert on something. Listen, you can be an expert up until the point where you disagree with what the Word of God says. And then you're no longer an expert. Now you're a heretic or worse. So stop entertaining those folks. Maintain a one-track mind. I don't care what they say. I know what I know and I know what I believe. And I know along with the apostle in whom I have believed in the Lord Jesus. So the believer has a crowd-resistant mentality. They have a one-track mind, verse 2. Notice verse 3. The believer sinks their roots deep. The believer has deep roots. He will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither and whatever he does, he prospers. Strength, stamina, stability, vitality, and God's favor. That's a winning combination, brothers and sisters. So the believer has a crowd-resistant mentality. They have a one-track mind. They have roots that are deep. Fourth characteristic is in verses 4 and 5. And it's simply this. The true believer, the person who is blessed, who knows Christ's righteousness as his own, has a weatherproof faith. Has a weatherproof faith. Verses 4 and 5. The wicked are not so. They are like chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in judgment nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. Brothers and sisters, it doesn't matter when you know Jesus, what the circumstances of life throw your way, you are going to weather that storm in Christ. It's Christ in you. It doesn't matter which way the winds are blowing. I had a conversation last night with some folks and it just amazes me the blindness of Americans when it comes to politics, people are so divided. Well, I'm of this and I'm of this party and I'm of this. You know, the Bible forbids that. Apostle Paul addressed that to the Corinthians. Why are you saying that you're of Apollos and you're of this person and you're of that person? Aren't we all of Christ? Shouldn't we all be of the same truth and the same conviction? Our politicians do this. To see which way the wind is blowing. And Christians are so gullible, they just follow them right off the edge of the cliff like a bunch of lemmings.
We have a weatherproof faith. We live in days, and we're out of time, and I didn't get half of what I wanted to get. So next week, well, unless the Lord comes back, and then he can tell you what this means, and then you'll have it for real. <laughs> we live in some very interesting times, don't we? But you know, interesting times provide us with lots of opportunity. People, because of the interesting times that we live in, people are more willing to listen today than they have been in a very long time. They're willing to listen to you when you have something to say about life beyond this. They're willing to listen to you today when you talk about Jesus because times are hard, times are difficult, things are very strange. Spirit In the spiritual realm, things are really strange, really strange. And I see things coming to pass that we've been talking about. We were chatting about this last night. Revelation, we just finished that study up last week. And that, man, if that's not a book for today, I don't know what is. If you haven't studied it, you need to do that. If you've been here for us, then you have. But Well, we'll, we'll jump back into it next week. I still have some things that I want to share with you. Eight Eight perspectives that we should have. This church needs to maintain the course that God has set before us. And when I say church, I'm talking about us. This fellowship. We need to maintain the course. We need to stay the course, if you will. We need to keep the gospel at the center of everything that we're doing. Because if we don't, we're going to be off the tracks and we won't even know it. The gospel must remain the center. Jesus saves is our message. And we are going to be fanatical about that. Jesus saves and only Jesus saves. But we'll get into eight things next week. Eight gospel-centered things that should characterize our lives. And it's going to build off of Psalm 1, and then we'll go into Psalm 2. But just so you know, and you can read ahead, Psalm 2. We'll get to it. We'll try to get to it. <laughs> Psalm, Psalm 2, here's the way I look at it. It's sort of like Genesis 2 and 3. You get a close-in view, then you get a far-out view. Well, that's how I'm going to approach Psalm 1 and 2, because Psalm 1 has to do with the individual believer and the individual lost person. But if you notice, Psalm 2 takes a steps back away from it and it says the very first verse in Psalm 2 is what? Why do the nations roar? So it's from individuals and it's pulling it back. Now it's looking at the nations. Well, nations are comprised of people, right? So, the na and what does it mean to, for a nation to roar anyway? Well, we'll talk about that next week, but it has to do with individuals who come together, right? Nations are individuals gathering together. So why do the nations roar? Well, the it should be obvious, but we'll talk about that next week. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you, Father, for your Holy Spirit that gives us understanding. We pray, Lord, that this week, as we leave this place, that you would give us the words to speak that people need to hear. And Lord, help us not to fret or worry or be anxious about what we'll say, but rejoice when the opportunity comes and then rely on you to supply exactly what we should say. Lord, we know we don't have to wax eloquent or we don't have to be a theological scholar. All we have to do is be obedient to seize that moment. And so, Father, prepare the hearts of the people you would have us to talk to this week. Thank you, Father, for this fellowship, this body of believers. You continue to sustain and provide for. We are so blessed and so thankful. We love you, Lord. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.